So, the elders of the church. Um, I was always told as a child to respect my elders. There's a phrase that always was said to me. I've not heard it as much recently, um, but I would always think it referenced just like older people or the elderly people or those who are retired. And the phrase nowadays, it almost implies this unconditional respect given to those older than you simply due to them being just that, older than you. And I don't know if you've had a similar experience at school, but even if a fellow student was a mere day older than you, they'd recite this phrase in order to get respect from you. And uh, they would, or to gain something from you or receive a level of preference from you, like if you had like a bag of sweets and said, ah, respect your elders, give me one first. (laughs) I know that happened to me. But reading something, in, I read something interesting this week uh, online, which was saying about how younger people learning from older people nowadays is becoming less and less. And um, it, w- it was more often before the internet came in, younger people wouldn't know how to make a cake. So they go to their mum, their grandmother, and say, how do you make a cake? Or they wouldn't know what happened during the war, and so they'd go to their um, grandfather or father and say, well, what actually happened? But now instead, we, and I say we because I know I do this as well, uh, younger people use Google as to how to work out what happened and find out what happened. Instead of going to a parent or grandparent and saying, hey, what, what happened? Or how do you do this? And I think there's there's an underlying expectation that older people have more life experience than younger people. And therefore, due to that, they're worthy of respect. And think this is, and I think this is where this implied unconditional respect has kind of probed itself into the understanding of this phrase, respect your elders. There is a reality that older people are much, like, much more likely to have had more life experience than younger people. However, I think now life has been so contrasting, comparing my upbringing to someone who is 70 is now worlds apart. Whereas I think, go back a few years and it would have been slightly more different. And I think it's clear that this phrase has come from the Bible. And I think it probably comes from this passage from 1 Timothy 5, whether it's earlier on, as uh, Steve was talking on last week, or whether it's this section particularly. However, I think it's clear that this phrase has been almost moralized from a, bi- from a biblical truth into more of a worldly kind of folly phrase that we just say. And we've seen over the, the past few decades there are many incidents where elders have not been worthy of respect or honor through things they've done, notably in, in churches, unfortunately. And as you know, this includes parishioners as well as ordained elders, to the point where I feel there is almost a disillusionment that has now surrounded this worldly phrase. But also the biblical truth that Paul is talking about in 1 Timothy 5. Now the context of this passage is that Paul is talking to Timothy about those that lead the church, so the elders that lead the church. And that's uh, those that kind of keep the church going, point it in the direction that it's going. And uh, I think the most kind of similar that we have here is the PCC. And obviously, Timothy fits within that eldership. But there seems to be this level of trust from what Paul, how Paul is talking to Timothy or kind of a lack of concern of Timothy kind of being all right on these issues. Um, although there does appear to be this slight warning from Paul to Timothy regarding favoritism at the end, which feels slightly different to the other ways that he's talking. Now, one of the words that stood out for me when I first looked and read, read this passage was well in verse 17 the word well. The first question I asked myself was, who constitutes whether a church is being led well? And then after that, I had some time reflecting on how a church can be led well one year, but then for four years, kind of either side, 
it could be led poorly by the exact same people and in the exact same way. And the word well in verse 17 is this Greek word kalos, which means exactly what you think it would. It means something that is good, something that is proficient or with excellence. And the word appears 89 times in the New Testament. And in the two books of Timothy, it appears 17 times. And that's second only in the whole of the New Testament to Matthew, who uses it 20 times. And I think this reflects the importance that Paul has on doing stuff well and says doing stuff well to Timothy in the leading of his church. And particularly elders. We see in this short passage of five verses, I'm talking about 17 to 22, how to keep our elders accountable. And when they come into disrepute, how to handle it. But also, I think more importantly, and I think Paul does this like intentionally at the start, where he talks about double honour before he talks about the issues of um, elders. So he says, actually, let's remember to, like, when our elders are doing well, let's really cheer them on. Let's give them the honour they deserve before going on to, actually, sometimes they do do wrong. And I think the term honour can seem dubious in this passage. However, according to Tom Wright, who, are, who really helps me understand things, the word is used and leaned much more towards finances. And within this passage, it regards those elders who toil in preaching and teaching. And I write notes about how in our country, a few, uh, way back, we made a move to pay vicars significantly less than other jobs. And this was a move to stop those becoming vicars just for the sake of earning lots of money, but actually doing it for the calling of being a vicar in their life. And this whole ser- that's a whole other sermon that I'm not going to go into. I'm sure there's, much, there's people who are better equipped to do that sermon than I am as well. But one part in this passage that I do struggle with is the take warning part. In other translations, it, it says, in fear of. And this suggests that elders shouldn't sin in fear of being caught or found out by those in the congregation. And I, this fear kind of sits uncomfortably with it with me because the way we usually talk about sinning and responding to sinning is that it it starts to create a dividing wedge between us and God, and that repenting of our sin and seeking forgiveness is what we should be doing to be made right again, and that should be our motivation for not sinning, not so that we uh, get found out or or anything like that. And it it, it is a valid reason not to sin, but there seems to be this implied covering up in the way that it's said in this passage. Which is not what should be happening. And we see that when that happens, there are scandals uncovered. And we've seen the fallout of many church leaders globally that have been viewed as great leaders or good leaders, and then there's a scandal or there's sin uncovered that comes out in the media, and that person is seen then as a a bad church leader. As I say that, I can think of almost three instantly, and I'm sure you can think of some as well. But it's important to support our leaders of our churches. Ron urged us a few weeks back to support our church leaders, and I think that is so important. I've seen churches that I've been connected to where the leadership hasn't been supported. And it puts the leader in a tough place before they've even done anything wrong. And part of this support, I believe, is accountability. It is so vital. Where elders slash church leaders who lead well receive double honour. Where on the other hand, James 3 verse 1 says that those who teach will be judged more severely. You have that parallel. You have those who lead well, they will get double honour. But when you don't lead well, there's double judgment. 
and that puts a weight on the shoulders of those in leadership. And I think that's why leadership shouldn't be done just willy nilly. Accountability is so important for all of us, not just leaders. It's not a way to shame us out of sinning. That would be an oppressive form of religion. But accountability is the showing of our humanness to a close confidant, where you can pray about the sin together, and that person will hold you to account if it rears its head again. So I feel as though I've brought up three issues here. The first one is the issue of young people's view slash mindset towards elders or generations older than them. There's a second issue of churches being led well and knowing what a well-led church is. And number three, there's the issue of leaders making mistakes and sometimes having a lack of support. Now, how these three issues are solved, I believe, comes from one place, and that is the person of Jesus. However, the starting place of right relationship with Jesus, I think, is clear and obvious for solutions. However, sometimes I feel we can forget this or allow the world to cloud out this truth, where all involved in the issue are close in relationship with Jesus, the starting point is brought closer to the solution that is needed. Whereas where there are people who aren't in the right mindset or place relationship with, relationally with Jesus makes solutions harder. We see through the way that Jesus lived his life and lived his ministry that it was based around younger people learning from older, more experienced people. We see this through his 12 disciples who were all very likely to be younger than him. It would have been ingrained in their culture, the rabbi-student relationship. And we've seen this this type of relationship be so important for learning for so many. I feel it's so necessary when it comes to discipleship particularly. The amount I've learned from an older, more mature Christian is enormous. And the most important thing about these relationships is that they are Jesus-centered, Jesus-focused, and Jesus-based. Now, one of the big things about these forms of healthy discipling relationships is that they grow people and leaders strong in faith, in tune to what Jesus wants for their life. And if they become church leaders or elders, what Jesus wants, uh, Jesus' plans are for that church and the church. Elders are so key to the church being led in the right way, which is with Jesus at the centre. Mature Christians who have experienced so many ups and downs in faith and have journeyed through most of their life with Jesus, because they can teach those Christians who have only journeyed a few years of their life with Christ, how to stay firm when it feels like their faith is being shaken and how to use mountaintop experiences as encouragements through dry periods. I'm a massive advocate of one-to-one discipleship, so I would be saying this, but I see this intentional time spent between someone mature in faith and someone still youthful in faith as a major solution for many problems. Ultimately, knowing Jesus thoroughly and choosing to walk with him daily is always what is needed. Choosing to walk with him daily may include things like an intentional relationship, as I've explained. It may include a friend being accountable for you. And it will include so many things, too numerous to list right now. I'll still be here tomorrow morning if I did start to list them off. I just want to say to finish off that and speak particularly to the elders of the church, those who are leading us, we see you work hard. We see you do a good job. Please remain faithful. Please remember the call that Christ has placed on your life. And we will be praying for you. We'll be supporting you and cheering you on.